read you a passage from the second book of Lewis's Space Trilogy, from the book Paralandra. Although it's in the final pages of the book, you don't need any spoiler alert. Um, there's no need to worry that I'm going to give away the plot. Anything you could reasonably call a plot is long since over by this point in the book. And all the characters have carried out all their significant actions. So if you haven't read it, you can still read it. I'm not ruining it for you. Because they're all done with everything that needs to be done. And yet the book keeps going on and on and on. And it goes on like this. The great dance does not wait to be perfect until the peoples of the low worlds are gathered into it. We speak not of when it will begin. It has begun from before always. There was no time when we did not rejoice before his face as now. The dance which we dance is at the center, and for the dance, all things were made. Blessed be he. Now maybe I should set this up a little more for you. It happens on Venus, after the Venus version of Adam and Eve face temptation and conquer it. That might have been a spoiler, sorry. An earthling named Ransom is there, along with a regular Noah's Ark of Venusian wildlife, and a bunch of angels. But angels are called Eldilla, or Oyarsas, and Venus is called Paralandra, and Adam and Eve are called Tor and Tenedril, and they're all very tall, and they're green, and they're naked. Everybody's naked for pretty much the whole book, and this is just one reason I'm not hoping for a movie version. Because you can read that, but you don't need to see it. There are 17 chapters in Paralandra, and it's in the 17th that all the characters gather in a mountain valley and have a kind of award ceremony, like the one at the end of the first Star Wars film. But unlike that celebration, where no one talks, this one features a speech. I wish I could tell you what kind of speech, but, un but Lewis isn't very much help with that. He describes it as a series of speeches, though they might have happened all at the same time. He describes it as a conversation, but he can't specify which words were spoken by whom. He describes it as a game, the great game, but then he immediately switches that title to the great dance in caps. It fits into a few pages, but when it's over, it has apparently taken one whole year, a Venusian year, of course. The main character, Ransom, has just come through a gruesome struggle, really grappling hand to hand with evil incarnate in a disgusting and dehumanizing form. Weston the Unman. He's worse than a zombie or a vampire. He's even worse than a demon, because he's got a body. Ransom has won, but he hasn't really got his equilibrium back yet. And just before this final passage, Ransom fills most of a page with a series of questions. I'm full of doubts and ignorance, he confesses. And he asks one question after another about the structure of the cosmos, the meaning of life, the point of it all. Ransom's questions are good ones but they're not really answered in any direct way. They're not exactly ignored, but they're thoroughly recontextualized. The closest he gets to an answer is, we would not talk of it like that. Take that, puny mortal. You have questions? We would not talk of it like that. Well, how would you talk of it then? Well, here's how they talk of it. Never did he make two things the same. Never did he utter one word twice. After Earths, not better Earths, but beasts. After beasts, not better beasts, but spirits. After a falling, not a recovery, but a new creation. Out of the new creation, not a third, but the mode of change itself is changed forever. Blessed is he. And then another said, it is loaded with justice as a tree bows down with fruit. All is righteousness and there is no equality. Not as when stones lie side by side, but as when stones support and are supported in an arch. Such is his order, rule and obedience, begetting and bearing, heat glancing down and life growing up. Blessed be he." That's how they talk. Ransom wants to know where the center of the universe is, and guess what? They would not talk of it like that. The spirit of a planet speaks. He says, though men or angels rule them, the worlds are for themselves. The waters you have not floated on, the fruit you've not plucked, the caves into which you have not descended, and the fire through which your bodies cannot pass do not await your coming to put on perfection, though they will obey you when you come. Times without number, says this planet, I have circled our bowl while you were not alive, and those times were not desert. Their own voice was in them, 
not merely a dreaming of the day when you should awake. They also were at the center. Be comforted, small immortals. You are not the voice that all things utter, nor is there eternal silence in the places where you cannot come. I was probably about 17 when I first read this, and it blew me away. I read that paragraph and immediately got up and paced the room and sat back down and wrote a sonnet. A terrible, terrible, terrible sonnet. <laughs> Bristling with semicolons and too many exclamation points and a lot of fancy words. I will never let you read that poem. I also drew some pictures and later on in the day I dug a hole. The point is, the strange conclusion to a science fiction story just knocked art right out of me. It took all the things I was taking for granted and proposed them to me as things that could actually be believed, embraced with the whole self, counted on, explored, investigated. I don't know what you think your deepest needs are. When I was 17, I had lots of ideas about my deepest needs. But this story came along sideways and bumped me out of those ruts, bumped me right out of the center of my own story, and let me know that I wasn't the most important thing in the world. I think I already kind of knew this. I had recently become a Christian, so I had some idea of what the most important thing in the world was. But here was an angel, or a planet, or a planet angel, or whatever it was, telling me, you are not the voice that all things utter. You are not the voice that all things utter. All through the Space Trilogy, whenever an angel appears to an earthbound creature, the angel looks like it's standing at a funny tilt. When Ransom asks why, the angel answers, I'm not here the same way you're here. Ransom figures out what's happening. He says, the planet, which inevitably seemed to him while he was in, an un well, while he was in it, an unmoving world, that planet was to them a thing moving through the heavens. In relation to their own celestial frame of reference, they were rushing forward to keep abreast of the mountain valley. Had they stood still, they would have flashed past him too quickly for him to see, doubly dropped behind by the planet's spin on its own axis and by its onward mar march around the sun. You see what's happening here? An earthling is realizing his frame of reference is not the absolute frame of reference. It's maybe not even the right frame of reference, though it's an understandable one. Somehow this message was easier to understand when it came to me from naked green people on an imaginary planet in a science fiction novel. I'm not sure why. It's Lewis's fictive sneak attack, I suppose. He probably says something just like this in Mere Christianity. But most of Mere Christianity was boring to me the first time I read it. I didn't have a taste for theology yet. I would need one in coming years, but I didn't have one then. It was Paralandra that met me where I was. In Paralandra, Lewis was able to loosen up a little bit and say things more wildly than he would let himself get away with in sober, prosaic essay writing. He may even have spent the whole book setting up a structure in which he could be this exuberant, this giddy, this effusive and lavish with his praise. I think chapters 1 through 16 are an excuse to get to 17. If I told you that a Christian novelist wrote a book about Adam and Eve in space, and that after the plot is resolved, he gives a whole chapter to the characters having a church service where they praise God, Many of you would vomit. <laughs> if I told you the chapter where they sang praises to God was the best chapter, you might be polite to me, but in your heart, you'd question my literary judgment. But it's the truth. Imagine that. Every word of it is true. Be careful of the story you tell yourself. This is some of the best advice my husband has ever given me, and he has to remind me of it often. As we pick up with Orwell in the climax of Till We Have Faces, she's coming to terms for the first time with the story she's been telling herself her entire life. Orwell has always believed two things with perfect certainty, that she loved her sister Psyche and that the gods tricked her into betraying Psyche and ruining both of their lives. Here, Orwell is finally given permission to bring her accusation against the gods. But when she tries to speak, a strange thing happens. Orel doesn't end up giving all the arguments she had been rehearsing. She doesn't justify her own actions, and she certainly doesn't prove that the gods were to blame. I looked at the roll in my hand and saw at once that it was not the book I had written. It couldn't be, it was far too small and too old a little shabby, crumpled thing, not like my great book that I had worked on all day, day after day. I thought I would fling it down and trample on it, 
Yet I found myself unrolling it. It was written all over inside, but the hand was not like mine. It was a vile scribble, each stroke mean yet savage, like the snarl in my father's voice. A great terror and loathing came over me. I said to myself, whatever they do to me, I will never read out this stuff. Give me back my book. But already I heard myself reading it. And what I read was like this. I know what you'll say. You will say I was shown a real God and ought to know it. Hypocrites, I do know it, as if that would heal my wounds. You know well that I never really began to hate you until Psyche began talking of her palace and her lover and her husband. Why did you lie to me? You said a brute would devour her. Well, why didn't it? I'd have wept for her and buried what was left and built her a tomb and, but to steal her love from me? It would be far better for us if you were foul and ravening. We'd rather you drank their blood than stole their hearts. We'd rather they were ours and dead than yours and immortal. If you've gone the other way to your work, if it was my eyes you'd opened, you'd soon have seen how I would have shown her and told her and taught her and led her up to my level. But to hear a chit of a girl who had, or ought to have had, no thought in her head that I had not put there, setting up for a seer and a prophetess, next thing to a goddess, how could anyone endure it? Do you think I wanted to see her happy in that way? It would have been better if I'd seen the brute tear her in pieces before my eyes. You stole her to make her happy, did you? I'll thank you to let me feed my own. It needed no tidbits from your table. Did you ever remember whose the girl was? She was mine, mine. Do you not know what that word means? Mine, your thieves, seducers. That's my wrong. Enough, said the judge. There was utter silence all around me. And now for the first time I knew what I had been doing. While I was reading, it had once and again seemed strange to me that the reading took so long, for the book was a small one. Now I knew that I had been reading it over and over, perhaps a dozen times. I would have read it forever, quick as I could, starting the first word again almost before the last was out of my mouth if the judge had not stopped me. And the voice I read in it was strange to my ears. There was given to me a certainty that this, at last, was my real voice. At last the judge spoke. Are you answered, he said. Yes, said I. The complaint was the answer. To have heard myself making it was to be answered. Lightly men talk of saying what they mean. When the time comes to you at which you will be forced at last to utter the speech which has lain at the center of your soul for years, which you have all the time, idiot-like, been saying over and over, you will not talk of the joy of words. Till that word can be dug out of us, why should the gods listen to the babble that we think we mean? How can they meet us face to face until we have faces? Instead of accusing the gods, Oral gets confronted with herself. She says out loud for the first time the real thing that she's been saying in her heart all her life. And it turns out that while she has lots of justifications for her actions, Oral hasn't known until this moment what her true motivations were. Oral finds out that she didn't love her sister the way she thought she did. In fact, Oral was so angry that Psyche had been chosen by the gods, had been taken out of her control, that she would have preferred the gods to have killed Psyche instead. Oral learns at this moment that she acted the way she did because she wanted Psyche all to herself forever. She chose to destroy Psyche's happiness rather than allow Psyche to be happy without needing her. Lewis is getting at so much in this myth, but I think one of the most important things he's doing is reminding me that really knowing what's going on in my heart is way harder than I think it is. Even when I take the time to look inside myself, which is hard enough in a world as shiny and full of distractions as this one, I still have to examine what I find there carefully. Sometimes when I ask myself why I did something, my heart will try to tell me I had good reasons for doing what I did, that I was totally justified. 
My heart covers up the real reasons why I act, especially when those reasons are sinful. You're probably all familiar with Jeremiah 17:9, which says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick, who can understand it? But most of the time when I hear that verse, I think it's talking about other people's hearts. I don't remember that my heart is deceitful, and I certainly don't remember that sometimes it's deceiving me. Sometimes after a fight with my husband, I lie in bed and rehearse all the reasons why I'm in the right and he's in the wrong. I revise my complaints again and again until I've phrased it perfectly, and then I imagine saying it to him and watching him fill with remorse and beg for my forgiveness. (laughs) But when I really consider my story honestly, I know I'm lying to myself. I'm telling this story so that I come out on top. I'm making myself the heroic victim, the one who did everything right, who suffered unjustly. But I know this isn't true. This loud complaint is only masking my own fault, all of the ways I could have done better but didn't. We all have motives we're ashamed of, and we're all pretty good at covering up those shameful motives, even to ourselves. But in this passage, Lewis is challenging us to uncover the true content of our hearts and take a good look at it. In the end, Oral gets a gift from the gods. She gets to hear her story, not as she would like it to be, but as it truly is. She gets to meet herself face to face. And when she does that, she gets to meet God too. This is something I'm still learning to do, and I need grace to do it. I want to know whether the story I'm telling myself is true. Am I making myself out to be the hero by editing out all of my selfish motivations? Am I making myself a victim to cover up the fact that I'm really feeling guilty for hurting someone else? When I know the answer to those questions, I'll be able to hear my own true voice. And only when I know what I'm actually saying will God be able to answer me. I sometimes joke that reading C.S. Lewis was both the best and the worst thing for me as a budding intellectual. It was the best, of course, because Lewis was brilliant, incisive, creative, unfurling the truth, beauty, and goodness of the faith for myself and others. But reading Lewis was also the worst thing for me because I wanted to be like him, and that was preposterous. (laughs) Still, I hope you've all had a chance to be inspired at some point by Lewis, and if you have it, you need to run, not walk out, and buy one of the works that's been mentioned so far, or one like them. But what was the danger of being C.S. Lewis for C.S. Lewis himself. What were the temptations of such brilliance? And what by extension are the temptations for us, who though we may not be Lewis's, are educated Christians, ourselves trying to work and study in our vocations that we might paint and articulate the truth, the beauty, and goodness of the Christian life for others. Jim Houston, who was just here last week and was a personal friend of Lewis's, writes that Lewis was a witty raconteur, a provocative debater, but was essentially shy about his inner life and what he experienced personally. Still, we get glimpses in his diaries, in his letters, which have been published, but also in his poetry, which is much less well-known to readers, but where Lewis was occasionally confessional. Lewis had that poetic imagination that could see the correspondences between things and metaphor and image from which the truth, the fuller truth of things emerged. And I'm going to look in particular this morning at his two stanza poem called The Apologist Evening Prayer, where he discloses to us that because of his brilliance, because of his brilliance, Lewis felt often spiritually weak and vulnerable. In the poem, we see this in two ways. One is the temptation that you and I have and that he had to be seduced by one's own powers and achievements, to trust them too much. And second, to rest upon these rather than letting them lead us to our greater need for God himself. It's important, by the way, that the poem is called an evening prayer because this would have been part of Lewis's tradition as an Anglican, the evening prayer, which was an opportunity at the end of the day to look back over the day and where one stood vis-a-vis God, where one had departed from his will, where one had sinned. This evening prayer practice is something, by the way, that we continue in Fives Chapel every Tuesday evening. Let's take a look at the first stanza. It is a single long sentence, and it's a request for God to deliver him. 
From all my lame defeats and oh much more, from all the victories I seem to score, from cleverness shot forth on thy behalf, at which, while angels weep, the audience laugh, from all my proofs of thy divinity, thou who wouldst give no sign, deliver me. Lewis begins by asking deliverance, but from what? Well, from his lame defeats, his inadequacies. But he quickly realizes that that is not the main threat. Rather, it's in his victories that he finds himself most vulnerable. Now, what we all love in Lewis's gifts, of course, is his cleverness. How adroitly and skillfully he makes the attacks on Christianity seem silly and illogical. And yet Lewis feels himself these to be the very moments when he himself can be seduced and entrapped by the power of his own gifts. At his worst moments, he finds that his cleverness becomes things he shoots forth, like artillery. They make him feel powerful. They please crowds who laugh, presumably at his opponents. And yet Lewis feels that this sometimes shades into a kind of self-glorification that makes angels weep while audiences laugh. In the last line of the poem, he will call these rhetorical arguments and performances that he would often make at the Socratic Club at Oxford or in other speeches and debates, he calls them trumpery. Flashy, but leaving him feeling empty. The second stanza, I think, moves us into a deeper place in Lewis's feelings. That this romance with the pleasure of one's ideas about God leads into a kind of distance and a loneliness from God. Let's read the second stanza. Thoughts are but coins. Let me not trust instead of thee their thin-worn image of thy head. From all my thoughts, even from my thoughts of thee, O thou fair silence, fall and set me free. Lord of the narrow gate and the needle's eye, take from me all my trumpery, lest I die. Lewis compares thoughts about God to money. Thoughts are but coins, he says. So what is money? Money, of course, is wealth. It's a kind of power. But it is something that by itself has very little real value. Your 25 cent quarter is really only worth about four cents in metal. It only gains its value by being exchanged for something else, for other real things. We buy $20 worth of food, a semester's worth of wisdom. For sure, our wealth offers a certain feeling of power and security. And Lewis himself was rich in thoughts about God. But he knew experientially this was different than real contact with God. He compares his thoughts even to an image on a coin. As our thin United States corridor bears the faint profile of George Washington, so Lewis found that his arguments, although they were true, were mere symbols, mere thin outlines of who God was that were meant to carry us to God himself. He knew that the coin of his thought, his learning, his knowledge, his education, needed constantly to be cashed in for the real presence of God. Of course, Lewis's words were not mere trumpery. They helped a whole generation see God. But he felt sometimes that he needed to fall silent, to be set in the presence of God and not just the ideas about God. And so he prayed to be delivered from himself lest he die. And Lewis knew that the Christian life is not finally about morality, right and wrong, and not finally about philosophy, truth and falsehood. It is primarily about life or death. As St. Paul said, you were dead in your sins, but you were made alive in Christ. So what can we learn from Lewis? Well, certainly his life as an apologist and fiction writer and poet is worthy of admiration and even imitation that all of us in our own ways need to be apologists in our own skills and gifts and crafts so that the world might see God better. But all of our learning is also like coin. It must be cashed in. Cashed in for a real relationship with God who is the source of our vision. The temptation of you and me, the highly educated Christians, will be to try and be satisfied with our own competence rather than with God himself. But we are not warmed by ideas. We are warmed by a person. We are warmed not by smoke, but by fire. 
So as you go now into your papers and finals and projects and presentations of the next two weeks, may you follow Lewis both in the good work of thought and learning for the sake of others, but always seeking God himself, who is your life and your vision. We hope you enjoyed this message. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Learn more at biola.edu.